Good morning and welcome to Finnehy Methodist Church on this Easter Sunday. I know for many of us it's hard to conceive that we would spend Easter not at our local church. Nevertheless, we are joining in a celebration that is shared with Christians right around the world today. So for that reason, we're going to join, join together in the traditional Easter greeting. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Join with me now as we share together in prayer. Let us pray. Praise be to you, O Lord our God. You have raised Jesus from the dead. You have glorified your Son. You have shown that he has broken the power of sin and death and given us the reconciliation that you desire. Your love for this world has triumphed over sin and darkness. In spite of our sin and rebellion, you never gave up on us, but you sent Jesus to be our Redeemer. He has shown your love, a love that is wider and deeper than we can ever imagine. Now he has opened the way to eternal life and we need never be parted from his love. So we celebrate this message of victory of salvation and of great love. Merciful Father, Jesus has shown love and true faithfulness. He went to the cross when he was rejected by his enemies and abandoned by his friends. Forgive us when we reject others with our prejudices, pride and selfishness. Forgive us when we abandon your truth for what pleases us. Abandon your way for our own desires and abandon your service for our own comfort. Jesus poured out his life that we might be forgiven. May his love and his salvation change our lives. May we live with the joy of being your redeemed people through our words and actions so that all the world may know and hear the wonder of your good news. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, our resurrected Saviour. Amen. The Gospel reading is from Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. Be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. People often ask me, what was the most exciting thing that you ever found in archaeology? 
and I try and stagger some sort of an answer. But the truth is that often archaeologists have no idea what it is they found. Now, that might seem a bit strange, but things are dug up and they're recorded, but oftentimes we have no idea of the significance of what it is that we have found. What might seem like a piece of pottery in the ground may be later on identified as a pottery expert as some extremely rare and significant piece of pot that sheds new light on trading practices or, or cultural exchange or something like that. All archaeologists working in the field have to record what they find. They do it by listing the dimensions and the appearance, the things that they can see. But separately, they also then record their interpretation, what they think it is. If you like, in the same way that we could be driving a car and we might see a red light. Now we can see that the light is red, but unless we interpret that sign as to mean stop the car, we might end up with an accident. So in the same way, the resurrection is doing the same thing. There is evidence, but there is also interpretation. There is the story of what happened, but there is also the understanding of what it means. Many people have gone over the ground of the various evidences found or not found, and there have been lots of books published about it. Things like Frank Morrison's famous book, Who Moved the Stone? But in spite of it all, the most that anybody could ever produce as evidence is an empty tomb. Nobody saw the resurrection happen. The interpretation of all that, that's different. Whilst the Gospels record in varying detail what people saw at the tomb that Easter morning, it's their interpretation of the events that is what is really significant. The Gospels tell us, as we Anita read for us there from Luke's Gospel, that others struggled to, to work out what on earth was happening. Peter went away wondering what it all meant. What is noticeable is that when the people later met, with the risen Jesus, it all fell into place. Mary, the other woman, Thomas, they all began to really understand what it all meant whenever they met with Jesus. Mary, Mary had heard the message of the angels, but she thought that Jesus' body was still lost. Peter had seen the folded grave clothes, but walked away wondering what it meant. It wasn't just a case that Jesus was no longer lying in a tomb, but that he was actually alive. Not just resuscitated, as some people try and make out, but that he'd passed beyond death. He was not a ghost even though he had been dead. All that he had told them beforehand quite clearly had come true. This was not a reversal of what had happened on Good Friday when he died, but it was a fulfilling of what happened on Good Friday, of everything that Jesus taught and that he claimed to be. What everybody had once said was impossible, he now showed was possible. So for people who had been through all the emotional trauma of grief, betrayal, and denial, and death, this was a lot to take on board. It was not what they expected or what they anticipated. We scorn the idea when somebody tells us that what they've, the story they have is made up or make believe. The idea that you can make up the facts to suit uh, the situation, that goes against our rational thinking. But equally so is denying truth. When something is put before us and the facts are there and we refuse to accept it, that's actually no better. 
perhaps this goes some way to explain one of the issues that Philip Yancey in his book explores. Why did Jesus make the resurrection appearances to the disciples? Why did he not just go and appear to Pilate or to Caiaphas or to any of the high priests? Surely that would have solved any doubt over his resurrection. But I think Jesus himself anticipated that argument even before his death. Back in Luke chapter 16, Jesus ends the story of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man with the words, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. It seems strange that there are people out there who deny things like the Holocaust or that astronauts ever walked on the moon. In spite of all the evidence that's there, they just simply refuse to accept it. Even the miracle of the resurrection will not sway a stubborn refusal to simply refuse to believe. And you'll notice that in the Gospels, there is no incident of Jesus appearing to any non-believers after his resurrection. Instead, Jesus appears to have deliberately appeared before Mary, the woman, and the disciples with a reason in mind. He not only wanted them to see his physical presence, but he wanted them to understand and to believe. They had heard his teachings. Some had even called him Messiah. Now they could put all the pieces together and form the whole picture. He was from God. He had fulfilled his father's mission. He was stronger than the grip of sin and death. And all those things that had brought death into this world. So the message of Easter Sunday becomes less about what happened, but more about what does it mean? Jesus had been raised from the dead. But more than that, we have a Messiah who has defeated death and offers us eternal life. Jesus reappears to those who knew him, who had heard his teachings. He was appearing to them not to impress them with this miracle, but to make them understand what it was all about, to bring them into complete faith. So for us then, it teaches that the resurrection is an event that happened, which we can choose to believe or not believe. But more importantly, it is also about a personal encounter with Jesus. That is where our faith is made complete. He lets all the pieces fall together for us, if you like. We understand and accept who he is and what he has done. Rather than just simply saying, oh, we acknowledge the events of 2,000 years ago. Jesus did not reappear to his disciples with any great gesture, arriving on a big cloud or speaking with a booming voice. All the accounts we have show a, a rather distinct ordinariness about it all. He's in a room. He's walking along a road. He's standing in a garden. And I think perhaps that's a clue to the kind of way that people encounter Jesus today. Not through some weird mystical event, but in our ordinary and everyday lives. We recognize that these stories are actually true. We find an assurance that all our past wrongs have been forgiven. We realize that more than this life, there is life eternal with him. Now, I know perhaps today I should have spent more time talking about the coronavirus. It seems that nearly every conversation or reflection comes around to it some, at some point. But I think the message of Christ's resurrection is so much bigger than that. 
if anything, it's giving meaning to our lives in the middle of lockdowns and social isolating. Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected, will be guiding us through these days and changing lives long after this pandemic has ended. Easter Sunday, it's a message that's 2,000 years old. It's the foundation that the church is built upon. And it is the faith that gives us eternal hope. Amen. I'm going to invite you now to join with me as we make our prayers for others. Let's pray. Lord our God, we call upon your name, the great and mighty name which has triumphed over sin and death. This is the name by which love has been made real in our lives. For you love the world, the one that you have created, and you desire that we should live in your love. We pray for your church, O oh God, the Easter people who proclaim your resurrected message. Spread across continents and oceans, men and women have come to faith in you. So we thank you for the ongoing mission of the church and pray your blessing upon your witnesses and evangelists who work in difficult circumstances. We pray for congregations all over the world worshipping you today, but not in gathered locations. For those at work in home or in hospital or care homes, those who are in essential services, May they all be able to join with all your people in giving glory to you. We continue to pray for the leaders of our nations who need to guide the decisions and strategies to keep people safe. For our Queen, Prime Minister, Government and Assembly. We pray for them and for their families who have been frequently separated from them in recent times. We give you thanks for the work of the essential services who have had to work in difficult conditions or for longer periods when colleagues have been quarantined. We pray that they will all have the necessary equipment to keep them safe. Lord God, let your Holy Spirit minister to all those who are sick at this time, that they may receive healing and wholeness. Minister to those who have been bereaved that they may have comfort and hope. Let your peace be known and your truth obeyed. And let us be faithful in our discipleship and witness. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus our Lord, whose prayer we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That concludes our service for today. Thank you for joining me. I hope that this Easter will be a time when you will see and feel and know God's rich blessing for you. I hope that will be a source of inspiration and guidance in the days ahead. And that you'll be able to join me again next week in our service. Until then, goodbye, stay safe, and God bless. <laughs>